we have any guests today? Yes. 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 We have a guest up there sitting next to you. Yes, we do. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, Reverend Anderson. I'm glad you can be here. Pleasure to be here. Announcements for today. This is the 20th anniversary of September 11th this year, and it falls on a Saturday. Because of this, we will hold, that was very appropriate time. Yeah, I'm <laughs> because of this, we will hold a service of remembrance on Sunday, September 5th. Most of us can remember exactly where we were when we heard of the fatal attacks and the fear we felt as we watched the towers fall. If you have any special memories or mementos you would like to share with the congregation, please bring them in and let us join together on that Sunday to pray for peace for the whole world. The search committee has a new volunteer. Please pray for the committee as we search for our new ministry. In our community, the Hands of Hope Free Lunch Program is held every Wednesday at noon at the St. Bridget's Catholic Church on Church Street in East Bloomfield, and it's open to all. On Saturday, September 25th, from 4 to 7 p.m., there will be a Harvest Roast Beef Dinner at the East Bloomfield United Methodist Church. And on Saturday, September 25th, there will also be a second annual Fall <laughs> and fun vendor event at the St. John's Episcopal Church in Honeyway Falls. That church also sponsors sacred yoga and meditation on October 12th, healing trauma program on October 26th, chakras on November 2nd, spirituality on November 9th, and that is at the St. John's Episcopal Church, 11 Episcopal Avenue, Parish House in Honeyway Falls. Their phone number is 585-624-4074, and there is a free will offering. Gentle Yoga, Beginner's Welcome, is held on Tuesday nights from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Free Lunch Program at the East Bloomfield United Methodist Church will restart in October on the third Thursday of each month community lunch and fellowship. The doors will open at 11.30 and lunch is served from noon to one. All are welcome. <clears throat> Free offering will be accepted and the church is accessible. Today, again, we are welcoming Reverend Ryan Henderson, our conference minister, who will be here to give the sermon today. And he will meet with the search committee after the service. Also today, there will be a trustees meeting. On September 25th, we will also have a communion that day. September 11th is the Highlander Cycle Tour Stop here. September 12th is a deacon meeting. The cabinet meeting is canceled. September 19th, Sunday School Kickoff Carnival. September 26th, the healing service and a trustees meeting. October 11th, a cabinet meeting at 6 p.m. And uh, if you have any joys or announcements to share, please send them to Ellie Babcock at her email address, ellie807 at aol.com. Thanks, Ellie. The community bulletin board is available for community use, and that's right out front. If you have something to be posted, please leave the item in the New Beginnings mailbox or mail it directly to the church. And that is visited often. I've driven by and seen several people stopping to look at that. So that's really nice service. And thank you today to our readers, Carolyn O'Dell and Jan Schrader. The liturgists and readers for August and September. Uh, on September 5th, Pat Pessel will be the liturgist. <coughs> Rena Faulkner and John Parsons will be the readers. And the fellowship hour will be Jean Bidwell, and Evie Thomas. On September 12th, Deb Footer will be the liturgist. Jean Bidwell and Linda Maskey will be our readers. And Linda Ensman and Gloria Miles will be responsible for the fellowship hour. 
On September 19th, Lou Fletcher will be our liturgist, and Susan Foose and Charlene Huber will be our readers. Fellowship Hour, Diane Marcellus, and Carolyn O'Dell, and then Carnival Explanation. <laughs> September birthdays. Happy birthday to Elaine Bird on the 4th, Mackenzie Smith also on the 4th, Richard Davenport on the 5th, Sue Forsythe on the 7th, and Greg Case on the 7th. And other announcements, I have two that were added. Uh, the, Blue, the Bristol Hills Historical Society is going for National Historic Registry for the Methodist Episcopal Church in Bristol Center, along with the cemetery, which is Revolutionary War era. If any of you have any mementos, any paperwork, any pictures, especially looking for any uh, weddings that might have been held in that church, could you please get in contact with me or drop it off at the Bristol Town Hall with your name and your number on it. We'll just make copies of it and make sure that you get it back. So uh, the report coming back from the architect firm is coming this week, and we're well on our way to, to historic registry, and the next step is getting a grant to spruce up and save our cute little church. The last Bible study program will be this Thursday at 6.30, and it will complete our Elijah study. Are there any other announcements? Yes. As a non-coffee drinker, I'm a little shaky this morning because I got a really strong cup of coffee with our neighbor, Scott McKee. He sends his greetings and his appreciation for all the support from the Bristol community and wants us to know that he's waiting until cousins in the Gormley part of the family have a memorial early in October and then we will schedule a memorial for Patricia Burley McKee here at the church probably later in October.
Oh God of mercy, justice, and forgiveness, thank you for this day and for the air we breathe. Bless this moment as we gather in your name and assure of the grace that we do not deserve, but that you pour upon us in abundance. May our time together be life-giving as we shout, we boldly celebrate your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Call to worship. God of this day, welcome, welcome us and give us courage. Us courage. God of this moment, empower us and grant us your grace. God of this year, invigorate us for newness and adaptability. God of our life, give us the peace that we desire in the spaces and places we need. Make it this time together life-changing. May it be so. Amen. In our opening hymn, number 505, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
you offer us your steadfast love in such abundance. Forgive us this day for the times we have not always accepted or welcomed your love in our life. Assure us that even though we are scared, you bestow upon us more than enough to wipe our souls clean in the grant of new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, there is a fact that remains that when we bring forward those things in our life that cause a barrier between us and God from being in tune with God's will, that indeed grace is poured upon us in such abundance that we might ever sense it all. But it is a gift that's freely given to each one of us, that forgiveness. But it's a gift that comes with cost. And that cost is that we need to also give that forgiveness to others. So may you indeed today accept the gift of forgiveness, but may you also continue to share it with others in your life. This is good news, friends. Amen. Please be seated and comfortable. Leading into uh, this moment of a special music for us, we are taking a time to breathe deep as we remember those 13 who have lost their lives this week in Afghanistan. We remember not only their lives, the service they've given, but we also remember the families and those who are left behind that are still feeling strong emotions and grieving. And so Bob will lead us in some very wonderful music. And I would say, if you haven't heard it, this is a safe space. So if you feel those emotions, feel free to allow them to be comfortable in this space as well as we enter into this time of special music. Thank you, Pastor. Um, we will be uh, honoring all four branches of the service and at the conclusion of the Marine Corps hymn, we will be doing, uh, I will be doing taps.
wonderful extensions of emotions that we share is, yes? Belonging. Belonging. That's, yes. We work well together, too. We and work well together. Whether it's a garage sale. Right. <laughs> or <laughs> or uh, a vacation Bible school, uh -huh. uh, uh, Bible study, uh, dinner. I mean, this church comes together and everybody does something. It's just amazing. Welcome bikers together when they yeah. come through, right? At 8 to 10 o'clock, sign-ups are after church. <laughs> We make sure to remember and, and be reminded of those times where it's important to lock doors, right, Fran? Right? So we make sure to always remember those things that we try to do these things in community and church allows us to have those relationships. We think about that too, and when we say it in church, we're united in Christ, the love of God, right? We're united in that bond that we find, and often, particularly with children, um, I like to share that one of the things that bonds us too is that that hymn we learn, or excuse me, that prayer we learn, that we say often. I was, I was thinking about, I wouldn't share this with kids, but I'll share it with all of you, all the young heart. Um, I was visiting somebody who, as she was getting older and dementia was hitting her, um, she was going back to the time where she lived in um, Hungary. She was Hungarian. And her English was leaving her, even though she was about 83 years old. You know, and it, just, it was just leaving her mind. But the minute I would visit her in the hospital, and I would start to say the Lord's Prayer, wouldn't you know, her English got clear as day. And in that pattern that we all learned, and in those moments, I could only imagine that she had learned that prayer when she was so young, coming here into the States, and it just stuck with me. So we think about that prayer that connects us, that unites us in Christ, that makes us a family, because we have that Lord's Prayer that we often learn, that we keep inside, we don't have to write down all the time because it's in us and it connects us to one another. Now, I would say too, because we're going to talk about a little bit of humor, you know often if somebody attends another church, because that church might be the trespass church, and we might be the sin church. I'm not going to say what church this is right now, I know it's the trespass church, but if you're from the sin church, you're more than, or the debt church, you're more than welcome as well when we say that prayer. And so I would ask us to be in an attitude of where we're having a little bit of fun, but we're also realizing how we indeed are connected as we say that prayer that we learned so long ago that continues to unite us. You could call it a family prayer. Our Father. Lord, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. sent into the office? Are there prayers? We, uh, we're also thinking about Haiti and those who have uh, lost life, lost property, lost things in Haiti. And um, as I was sharing with Reverend Sue, um, that I often think too about this time of the year and it's happening yet again. Uh, my first, one of my first churches, we often lead mission trips to New Orleans and Biloxi, Mississippi. And New Orleans, particularly after the Katrina hurricane, and so the Facebook reminded me that it was a year or many years ago, and showed me some pictures. And so thinking again about those on the Gulf Coast, um, our UCC churches in downtown New Orleans, uh, and the different River Ridge, which was the ward that we used to stay in. So I think about those folks as well, um, and all in harm's way. Are there other prayers we need to keep as a community? Yes. Uh, for my sister in Scotland, a friend of their family okay. uh, has fallen down a flight of stairs and broken their neck, uh, so okay. they're in serious condition in the hospital. First name of that friend, or just uh, Trevor? Trevor. Trevor. Okay. Keep Trevor. Prayers. Yes. My brother Elwin, who's in stage four brain cancer. Mm -hmm. Owen, who is in stage four brain cancer, we continue to keep 
even close as well. In addition to those of the U.S. military forces who died last week, all of the Afghan citizens mm -hmm. and their families. Yes. We continue to keep all those in harm's way in Afghanistan, and particularly peace workers and, and folks that are there. And you know, the, the pictures are etched in your brains, aren't they? So we think of those pictures. And the reality behind them as well. So we have prayer and requests for Trevor, for Elvin, for Haiti, for New Orleans, for those in harm's way, both with the troops in Afghanistan, but also those Afghanis and peace workers that are there that support all that's happening. We receive these prayers from our congregation, prayers for Bill, by Bill for Wendy, who's been in pain for the last few days, and continued prayers for Lisa and Tony for peace and comfort. Prayer for all the children and grandchildren going back to school. <clears throat> prayers for Mackenzie as she heads off to Finger Lakes Community College. <coughs> prayers for Mark, who is in ICU with COVID. Prayers for our longtime friend Pat, who is recovering from surgery. Prayers from Diane. They are prayers of thanksgiving for this congregation. And we have been overwhelmed with birthday support, encouragement cards from members of this church. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our world leaders. May they continue to know that to whom much is given, much is required. Lord, hear our prayer. Continue prayers for Sally's niece and her significant other who both have COVID. For Joy, who is suffering with multiple back issues. For Kristen and Fran, who has Lyme disease. For Linda's two friends who have COVID. For the school districts as they try to open back up this fall. For Joanne as she recovers from the back surgery. We pray for Char H's sister Jane. She had a small stroke and is now recovering. For Marcia, who, or Marcia, who is recovering from surgery from a fractured kneecap. For Joan, as she continues to heal and gain strength. We pray for all those who are fighting addiction to alcohol and drugs, including Jay and Chip and Stephanie. We pray for Sarge as he recuperates with extensive heart surgery. We pray for all the children of the world. May they come to know the love of Jesus in their life. <coughs> We offer prayers to 12-year-old Skylar and her family. Skylar is fighting a very rare cancer. For 9-year-old Evie, who is recovering from a rare autoimmune disease. Pray for John, who is recovering from heart surgery. For Jane and Don, who are suffering from recurring vertigo episodes. Prayers of love and compassion for Paula. We pray for our church family members and friends, for Art and Priscilla, Richard and Norma, Linda and Bob, Spence and Donna, Sally, Richard, Linda, Tom, Mary Lynn, Mary, Jean, Diane, Charlene, Elaine, Anne, Gladys, and Sandy. May they walk in the light of our Lord. We pray for Richie, for Brooke, and the family of Richie, continues to heal. Pray for our church family as they send prayers of love and mercy to Jim and Priscilla S. and Faye, Cynthia, Jane, Eleanor, Dorothy, and Alex. For all those in assisted living and nursing homes. We pray for their caregivers and families and friends. We pray for Wilma, Bob, and Mary, and all those who are in home care. Our church family offers prayers and strength for all who continue to battle cancer. For Paula, and Stephanie, and Lance. For Steve, and Stephen, and Ellen, and Sherry. For Jeanette, and Donna N, and for Brian, and Roger. May God walk with them on their journeys and with those who care for them. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue prayers for those who are here at home and around the world who are on the front lines fighting the coronavirus, 
especially the Delta variant, and for all victims and their family. Lord, hear our prayer. We give thanks, O oh God, and pray for our church cabinet, for the search committee, and for all the dedicated church members who willingly do your work here in the church and in the greater community. We offer those prayers, O oh God, in a moment of silence. As we offer all those prayers that have been said, we also offer the prayers that are in our lives, prayers on the tips of our tongues, the prayers that are being felt and experienced by others. We ask God that you would continue to find those places and spaces where your spirit might blow like a cool breeze into the midst of struggling hearts and find a space where they are needed. God, we continue to seek your prayers and your wisdom for all those who continue to fight violence in all its forms, for bullying. We ask God that you would continue to be with those who have addiction on their heart, whether they be physical or they be of the mind. We know that these are real and that they can take away from the quality of life. God, we ask all these prayers this day in Jesus' name, who continues to walk with each and every one of us, even when we don't recognize it, and even in those moments when we need it the most, and even in those moments when we don't have the courage to say what we need, God, we know that you know what we need. And so we're thankful for your presence in our life and in this very moment of prayer. As we say as a community, Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 17. Chapter 17, and it is verse 20 through 26. We often know that John spoke in language that was uh, sometimes very kind of mystical. Uh, but this is one of those moments, if you have a Bible in front of you and it's one of the red letter, this is the actual words of Jesus attributed to him. And this was a word and a conversation that he was having. And so we hear this as a, a prayer is being offered to people who are hurting. Let us listen to those words. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world might believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become completely one. So that the world might know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This sends our lesson today from John 17, chapter 20. It is a joy to be here. I, I really say that, and, and, and to see to see friends. Lyle, I haven't seen you in a while, and it is a joy to see and uh, friends that I've seen. I was trying to remember the last time I preached here, and you know, time just goes kind of as it does. So I don't remember what year it was, but it's just it's nice to see familiar faces as well. So just thank you for having uh, allowing me to be in this midst. And Reverend Sue, thank you as well for the invitation. So if we could be in an attitude. Here, God, today may we hear less of me, but more of thee. Less of me, but more of thee. Less of me, Holy One, but more of thee. Speak, for your servants are here, and they are listening. Amen. It was 11 years ago that I had one of the most religious moments 
in my entire life. It was a life-changing moment, a life-altering moment, a speck of time that has changed the course of my life, but it was nowhere near a church. I was in Philadelphia in a large group. My brother Chad had brought me there, and as we stood in this group of people, I heard the call to a faithful response. The leader was saying, have you come here for forgiveness? Have you come to raise the dead? Have you come here to play Jesus? One love, one blood, one life. you got to do what you should. One life with each other, sisters, brothers, one life. But none of you are the same. We have the faithful privilege to carry each other, for we are one. Now you may think this was a preacher. It was a very uncommon evangelist at the time. If you know those words, you are right. It was the preaching of Bono from the Irish rock group U2. And he was speaking from his pulpit at the Wells Fargo Center on their tour. And he was singing the song that has become a staple at most U2 concerts, One. The song has become a rallying cry to live faithful and just, viewing and seeing the world as interconnected. And in that moment, the response of many that Bono would ask and welcome people to do was the raising of their cell phones. And in that moment, the raising of the cell phones would become a prayer and a testimony to the solidarity of what it is to work as one for justice and for peace. And they would continue to see as all were created equally a true amazement in the moment. I can picture it like it was yesterday with that cell phone in that air. I can picture it like it was yesterday when Bono was speaking from Wells Fargo and he said to those 20,000 or so people, turn on the light in your phone and raise it high. It reminded me of Christmas Eve when we have those candles in a space, and for those of you who are in German background, we would sing the Schieleck Nacht, you know, silent night at that midnight service, and we would raise those candles and those phones high, and we would see in that moment that while we were just one candle, one little cell phone, when we raised them together, the light became immense. The light would become, just take over the whole space. I can only imagine this church on a Christmas Eve as candles would be raised to take from our little light the light that would just glow throughout this space. Can you see it in your mind? Can you imagine the power that those lights and cell phone and that response has in those moments? How they would become a prayer and a testimony to the solidarity of what it means to work as one community for justice and for peace and for hope for reconciliation. This is the same type of prayer that Jesus shares today in John 17. It's slightly different because it's not so action-oriented, but it is in many ways a call to response. In John 17, Jesus was teaching and healing the people, and some disciples were sitting there, and he was reminding them in very plain words, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. You're not going to see me forever. In fact, I might even leave here soon. The disciples were confused. And they asked, you know, well, what do you mean? I mean, how long is a little bit of time? How long will you be here? We want to plan on it. We want to, we want to have a, a dinner about it. We want to do something about this. And Jesus said, you know, I really don't know. Jesus tries to explain what he's saying is that, you know, what I'm doing here on earth, it's meant to be. And my life, it's going to happen, and it's going to go on, and you're going to continue to be faithful people. How the world and God will continue to be will be how you make those to be. He explained how he needs to die in order for the disciples to truly live, and still, as we read, the disciples, they didn't quite get the message. They were still thinking about the tangible. They were still thinking about the times and moments when they could plan things. They didn't understand yet in a strong way, the connection between Jesus' death and their life 
in the days to come. So Jesus does something that he often does in Scripture. Right after telling parables, he would often say prayers for those that they might have prayers of illumination in their life. And I can just imagine Jesus in that moment with the disciples who may not have fully understood. And he might have raised his hands to the sky and he might have prayed God to glorify his words. God, if, if they know, we pray that you might realize the connection between us. That they might realize the gift that you have put in me, God, in the midst of this time. Jesus would then go on to pray for his disciples, that they might understand this deep connection, this deep loving relationship with God who is both his father and mother, God who is his parent. Jesus prays that the disciples might recognize in that moment that each of us are interconnected. Each of them are dependent on one another and each of them will need each other. When things change, he's gone. Jesus then prays, and this is a little nuance, so if you're a, a word nerd like me, he prays not only for all who believe, but he says, I also pray for those who will believe. That little addition includes all of us, right? He says that they might, in the days ahead, understand that they might all be one. God, just as you are in me and I am in you, that they might all be one in complete unity. This is a radical call in the midst of these days. This was a prayer that Jesus shared so long ago, more than 2,000 years. And I'll be honest, I can only imagine the disciples of that day and age when they heard this, this was not an easy prayer for them to try to understand. And it's not an easy prayer, amen, for us to understand now. Can you imagine what it would be like in this moment with all the news and all the stuff out there in the cycle? How much of our life has us trying to convince us that we're all independent agents, that we need to always keep the distance around another weather, that we don't need a community in order to be in a community, that we don't need a community in order to grow into our lives. I can only imagine what this scripture passage, and I've, I've actually thought about this passage before, before COVID, but I'm thinking about it now more in the light of things that are happening right now. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of time, and again, maybe if you're the same, the amount of time that I've thought about what my bubble looks like right now in the midst of COVID, about who I'm interacting with and who I see in a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, think about all the moments in this time, day and age, how you've thought about people you stay connected to, whether it be grandchildren, children, um, people in our community, have you thought or have you found ways to communicate in different ways? Maybe you've experienced Zoom, Maybe you've had more phone calls than you've ever had. Maybe you've sent more emails than you ever have. And maybe, even if you're old school, you've sent more letters than you ever have and you realize, man, these stamps are expensive. You know? so, I mean, I can only imagine a few years ago if we had talked about the United Church of Bristol putting their sermons on YouTube. I can only imagine what the conversation would have been like, but this is your constant mode of communication right now, and there are people who depend on this message and ministry right now, watching here. Because of the day and age we're at, do you think more and more about the people you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you think more about the people who you see in a store? Have you ever had the experience now that if somebody coughs in the midst of somewhere, you turn your head and look at them and kind of think about where's my mask or hand sanitizer? Do you think about the people that you see in a doctor's office? Or do you think about the people that are in your children's and grandchildren's schools that are maybe taking care of them or how the schools are managing with what they need to do to allow others to feel connected and continue to be in school? Have you ever found more and more in this day and age that you think about the similarities that connect us in our community? And somehow some of those things that we used to think were differences just kind of melt away. We don't necessarily find them to be such a big deal. I mean, I wholeheartedly believe, we believe that if this time of COVID has taught us anything, 
it's particularly been in the church. And particularly what COVID, I believe, has taught us is the awareness that our churches are communities and that our communities should take nothing for granted. We should cherish each and every moment we have together. Not to take for granted any of those potlucks or those congregational dinners or coffee hours. Uh, not to find that we're spending more and more time on gossip, but more and more time on actually being in community with one another. And I will tell you, friends, that not every church believes this. I believe in the Congregational United Church of Christ, we are unique in that sense, because we do feel that our community comes from this being with one another. It's part of our DNA, it's part of our identity, and in reading your history as well, um, it has been part of your community um, for quite a long time, even when your church was founded from uh, folks from Kennedy. So, you know, this has been part of our community ethos and our DNA for many, many years. I think about it too that when Ben Herbster was installed as the new General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ in 1961 at the General Synod, um, that was the General Synod, for those of you keeping score, um, where we actually affirmed our bylaws and constitution, which is really fun. Like, that's really, this is, this is good theological times when we talk about constitutional bylaws. But the coolest thing about that 1961 meeting was the first phrase that they put into the preamble of our constitution that still matters and still is in existence to this day, and it says these words, believing that denominations exist not for themselves, but as part of the church universal, and hearing with a deepened sense of responsibility the prayer of our Lord, that they may all be one, we now declare ourselves to be one body. That's pretty awesome, I have to say. And that's pretty cool because that is continued to be who we are. It's a message that many of us live and may not even realize from day to day. It is a ground desire for us, the faithful, to live differently than other parts of our society. For instead of focusing on differences and things that drive us apart, we look more intensely for the common links, the similar bonds, the things that connect us in Christ. But as we said so long ago, that is not easy. It's easier said than done. Because in order to do that, we need to let go of some of the hurt feelings. We need to let go of some of the things that continue to build walls instead of bridges. And so that is part of our struggle here, to continue to listen to that prayer that Jesus gave so long ago, a prayer that we continue to live out in this day and age. So I ask you, brothers and sisters of the United Church of Bristol, you know what your choice is going to be today? We have choices every day. What will your choice be today? Sitting as I see in this place of discernment about your future history. It's not just about finding a pastor. If you've ever heard that, it is a total lie. This is about discerning the future of your church, the next chapter of where you will go, the next chapter in a long history that has been here for many, many years. As a church and as a search committee, will you continue to find a new status quo? Or will you choose to respond in a new way? A way that's maybe lifting the candles or the cell phones as individuals by finding that glow that comes from the midst of your community. It's like raising your hands to do the work that must be done, to continue to rework the unity of the church to make God's kingdom real here in Bloomfield, in Bristol, as it is in heaven. And that's an awesome challenge to do also an awesome challenge because when I think about it, I think about that uncommon evangelist that called people together in a concert space many, many years ago for me along with my brother Chad. And as he said, there's only one love. And there's only one blood. Only one life. And you've got to do with it as you should. One life to share with sisters and brothers. One life, but none of us are the same. You have the faithful privilege to carry one another in those tough times, but also in the joyful times. For we, Bono would say, are all one. And I think Jesus would have bought him at that same moment. And 
And I think John, uh, Jesus would challenge all of us to think about that question as well. What will our answer be when we come to the question of living in a new unity, united in Christ? I know what my answer will be. What will yours be?
at fault for us. This is for my traveling companion. I have a new traveling companion, Char. We went to Corning last week. I got to see, I left the house at 10, got home at 9.30 at oh. night. And we had, I thought we had a really good time. <laughs> so thank you. I did. <laughs> Yesterday, we took our 14 year old Ava school shopping, got mauled. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> she loved it. It was wonderful to be able to reconnect. 14, you know, she's a teenager and it's kind of hard sometimes, but we had a wonderful time. And three down, two more to go. Monday, Tuesday, we take yeah. Logan and Sophia. <laughs> I had a chance this week, in fact, I had a phone call from Paula. I did not have to call her, she called me. And she sounded very, very good. And she still got a lot on her plate, but she sounded better than I heard her sound in months. So praise God for that. And the other thing is, I never, I haven't told anybody how much I deposited this week for the garage sale. The coins, I couldn't believe. I'm so glad they got that thing at Candago National that you do not put all in. It was like $39.40 and most of them were dimes and nickels. So it helped out immensely. Anyways, you raised $755. Whoa. Thank you very much, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my family had a soiree yesterday to celebrate my youngest great nephew's birthday. He turned eight. Mm. I never saw a kid so excited about opening presents in my life. Uh, he ripped through those uh, in no time flat, but uh, my brother's whole family was there and it was just wonderful to gather. Before anyone asks, the dahlias on the communion table are not from my garden. They're from that beautiful half acre in Ionia, which is my contemporary parallel to being a kid in a candy shop. It was so much fun to go there and pick blooms. First, even though we mourned his death in Texas a few days ago, we give thanks for the life of the Odell family friend, Mark, who was really an informal foster kid sleeping on the couch and such a good friend to Patrick and Timothy during their growing up years. And Stephanie talked about previous pastors. This is a bit of a time test going way back. Uh, some decades ago, when this church was filled with family and friends and colleagues. Former beloved pastor, A. Claire Potter, said, this is a day long to be remembered in Bristol. And as I look around in the congregation, I think maybe Joan Hall is the only one who's been around long enough to have been here in person that day as we gathered. Oh, and Diane was here, wonderful. Um, it turned into a a day-long meeting with Picnic on the Grounds uh, in celebration of our common calling. My joy is that of my traveling partner, Ellie. We had a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to more excursions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 
off camera it was, when do you want to go is next. I think that's what that's about. <laughs> this is an IOU from last week. <laughs> We're in that spirit of joy, and part of that connection, too, we find is the word covenant and how we join ourselves. So if you could join me uh, in 471, which is our closing hymn today, What a Covenant.
May you fear God just enough that you need not fear anything else in life, and may God calm you just enough that you know that forgiveness and holy love is real and poured out for you. And may you go into the world to render no evil for evil, no hardship for hardship, but boldly be the incarnate word made flesh. As you go in the name of God as our creator, Christ our Savior and Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit our Comforter, and the one that continues to nudge us toward unity as we continue to build a just world for all. Amen. Go in peace and bump it over. <laughs>